Thank you. Just anybody on this side want to specially introduce themselves or, or raise a particular question up front that I should try to cover? Going, going. No, no, no. I think um, um, I think you'll find the, the the story that I have about presentation of storage will be consistent. Containers essentially are presented file system storage rather than block storage. Of course, under the hood, your your host can can be presented block, mounted, and then mounted into the container directory tree. Um, so if you understand, once you understand that, you'll start to be able to take a view. I think the key thing that you'll be thinking about is density, right? If I've got amazing density on a server, that means I've got a lot going on. So w what can I do with the storage layer to really optimize for tremendous density, right? Um, okay, so a little bit of history. This is a Unix slash Linux slash Windows systems. They all look basically the same, right? If I install Linux on a system and boot it, just install Linux and boot it, and do PSAX, like tell me about the processes here, I see a bunch of processes that are essentially doing housekeeping, right? So I've got syslog there, I've got init there, I've got things that will trigger off cron jobs, I've got a bunch of sort of administrative processes. And I've got a disk, uh, and I've got an IP address, right? And that's a system. And when uh, I install an application there, I essentially say, look, let me put this process on this file system, and it can look left and right, and it'll see other processes that it's sharing this file system, right? Really straightforward, this is just a Linux system. And so clever folks in the 60s said, why don't we virtualize that? Uh, and they introduced virtual machines. And a virtual machine is essentially emulating hardware largely. Now much of that's done in hardware itself. But fundamentally, what we did that was clever with virtual machines, we essentially made this look pretty much exactly like that. VMware absolutely mastered this. No one does it better. Essentially, if you want to recreate everything you've got at this in this world in virtualization, VMware's got the product for you. Linux does it very well with KVM. Um, but the essential idea is that we make administrators and developers' life easy by making it look exactly the same. And there's another nice benefit from doing this, that we can, we can put Windows over here, Linux here, other way around, doesn't really matter, right? So, so essentially, we're, we're, we're able to recreate everything that we might want to do here, down here. Uh, and the first step into containers really was pioneered by Sun, and then IBM tried to bring that work to Linux, and then they shut that down. We took that over, and then Docker got built on top of that. So this looks something like this. Smart guys at Sun said, you know, if we don't, if we, if this operating system is going to be the same, basically the same version of the operating system as this, and it seems a little odd that we essentially put a kernel here that's exactly the same as the kernel here. Right? So just, just if this is going to be Linux and this is going to be Linux, why do we need another Linux here? And you look at a lot of bank, um, organized ba banks today, and they'll have 50,000 largely idle VMs. Largely idle VMs. Most of the IT portfolio, real estate, is, is idle VMs. So the thinking is, well, why not just essentially um, uh, create a space in this kernel? Create a space in this kernel and put a bunch of processes that are really running down here, really running down here. They're running on this kernel. But when they look left and right, they see other processes that are also in the same space. And that's exactly what a container is, right? It's just a set of lies that we tell these processes. And we can tell those, structure those lies around file systems around network interfaces, around processes, around users. What do I mean? Well, this old system used to have a list of disks that were mounted. This disk is mounted at slash. This disk is mounted at slash home. Right? I've got a set of disks. That's my mount space, effectively. Right? Today, this kernel essentially says I've got lists of lists. Right? So these processes, they're using the the root list, the base list, right? But these processes, I can give them their own list of disks. When they say, tell me about my file system, they can see a disk at slash and a different disk at home, which are completely different to the disks that these guys see. So it's just a lie. Just like virtualization is a bit of a lie, 
right? All we're doing is tweaking what these processes see so that they create the illusion of being alone on this machine. But there's some very nice properties to this. We don't have a hypervisor here. There's no virtualization. There's no emulation of hardware, even if that's optimized now in silicon and so on. It introduces a, le introduces a level of indirection here, right, which is really quite awkward. Really quite awkward. For example, say you're a telco and you're streaming packets across a wire, right? And your application is up here, your VNF is up here, right? Now, to allocate CPU time to that application, I actually allocate CPU time to a process down here which represents that virtual machine. And then the guest kernel in there turns around and allocates virtual time to the virtual thing. So you see, there's no direct way for me to say, I want time on the CPU down here to this application over here. But this application process in a container is nothing more than one of a set of processes that are really running down here. And so now I can put time on that process with incredible granularity. In fact, all of the precision of, of quality of service and so on and so forth that I get just on a normal Linux system amongst the processes there, I actually have with containers. So we can do far better quality of service. Now this kind of container, LexD, drives that kind of work inside in the Linux community, right? So what does it, what does it feel like? Um, uh, I happen to have a container there, but I'm making a new one. Uh, and essentially what I'm doing is I'm copying a Linux file system into a directory. So I make a new subdirectory where I have a Linux file system. And if I have a look at my mounts, oh, that's really messy. If I have a look at my mounts, you'll see that there are some that, can you guys read that? That's at LexD containers Jasmine Wesley, I have a directory mounted effectively. And if you go and have a look in there, um, sorry, I have to go. Um, that's mounted in a funky place. So um, if you go and look in there, basically, it's just the root file system of a Linux system. It happens to be Ubuntu, but it could be CentOS, Debian, anything else, right? So um, if I go into, if I list my containers, now you'll see this one, Jasmine Wesley, is running, and it's got an IP address. Let me launch another one. Includable Rosario, and if I let see list, you see it's DHCPing right now, and if I do that again, it'll have an IP address, right? So now I can exec, um, I can exec bash in there. What have I done? I have jumped into, I've created a process, I've just run bash essentially inside the set of lies that all of these other processes are sharing. And if I go and have a look, you'll see there's only that set of processes running. Now this is a, a base set of processes for a new system effectively. I've got no applications running there. That is effectively this set of processes here. So you see how I've kind of created the illusion of a little machine in a second, right? You see how fast it is. So that's very, very cool. It's really fast. I can get any kind of Linux I like in there. We did a great bit of R&D with Intel around uh, mapping old supercomputer code into modern supercomputers because they had disks from old supercomputers that we couldn't see. But those disks, essentially, they wanted to run exactly that software on a new supercomputer. The problem was, of course, that software doesn't run on the new supercomputer, but Ubuntu does. And so by making these containers, they literally could copy the disks from those old supercomputers into the file system and launch the container, and that software all came up. And they couldn't measure a performance difference running it here versus um, running the same software here, right? So. Running it in a container is running it at bare metal performance, right? Because you're on the same kernel. Typically, um, about uh, 14 times the density for idle workloads than VMs. 14 times. So if you're a bank, for example, you've got lots of idle Linux VMs, this is very, very attractive. You don't magically get CPU cycles, so you can't create two supercomputers for the price of one, right? What the supercomputer, what HPC guys tend to do, is they tend to put a single container on the machine. And so why would you do that? Why would you put a single container here? Because now you get some of the semantics of a hypervisor. So with LexD, I can move a container from one machine to another, right? 
And so that feels a bit like a hypervisor. It, you know, it's not vMotion, but it's close enough that for a lot of things it's super useful. I can snapshot it. So classic HPC example, you spin up a job across 800 machines. That job's going to run for nine hours. If one of those machines dies, or one of those processes dies, five hours in, you have a choice. You either run the rest of the simulation, getting more and more inaccurate, losing essentially fidelity from that loss, or you restart. But now we can snapshot right, that single container on every machine every 15 minutes, every 20 minutes, and then restart. And uh, we tend to use sp specific file systems that give us that capability. ZFS is very popular. Um, that give us that capability on um, uh, four containers. Just check how I'm doing on time. Any questions so far? Any questions? Okay. So, so far, so good. Essentially, LexD feels just like a hypervisor, right? I launched, just like I could KVM launch something, I now LexC launch something, right? So I'm just creating machines. And a lot of PaaS's four or five years ago, this is what they built on. So uh, Peroku, Cloud Foundry, you name them, this is what they built on, right? The previous version was LexC. LexC is now a client, LexD is a daemon. Uh, this is LexC 2.0, effectively. But most of the PaaS's that you know, this is what they used. And then a PaaS called .cloud, um, a guy there had a very clever idea. He said, look, actually, often, for certain classes of applications, I don't need all of this, because I don't need syslog, because I'm sending my logs over the network. And, and for various reasons, I can get away without these. It's a bit of work to make this app, to, to be able to assume that this app doesn't need these guys. Right? So I should say that. About 85% of apps can just move from there to there. Um, box moved a whole ton of scientific Linux from, from uh, VMs to, to LexD on Ubuntu. So it's Ubuntu down here, it's scientific Linux up here. Pfft, the app doesn't know, right? Because this experience up here is the same as this experience up here. By and large, apps that are just like, at, the, at a high level, PHP, Java, anything like that, they're not going to, not going to care. They'll, they'll move across straight away. Apps that want to fiddle with the kernel could cause a problem, right? So telco networking apps, not so easy. Okay. Anyway, so the Docker guys had a really clever idea. Ah, builds. So just the key point. Operating a VM, same as operating this. How do I install software? How do I update the software? How do I patch manage it? So on and so forth, right? Operating a LexD machine container, exactly the same. But what the Docker guys did is really clever. They said, if I don't need all of these things, I can get even denser. Right? How much denser depends what's going on, but the point is I get, a kind of, I get a kind of precision when I'm literally just running a single process in a container. So the way to think about Docker is, is it's a process with an IP address. Right? When you do Docker run, you're creating like a process with an IP address. And the big change here is actually in the operations layer. Right? So a lot of people think oh, Docker is like a it's like, a, it's like a package. It's like a way to get MySQL on my system. It's not a very effective way to do that. What it is is a very effective way to run 15 MySQLs, right? In other words, if I want hyperelasticity, if I have n machines and m processes, and I don't really care about the mapping between those two, right, then this becomes a very, very elegant way of very quickly creating more capacity, more compute capacity, spinning up more of those processes, or shrinking it down. And typically, these are used for what they call 12-factor applications, um, stateless applications, where all the logging, all the disks, everything's getting done elsewhere. Right? So storage, a lot of guys asking about storage. Storage you know, is coming over here. People are building more capabilities to bind storage to these things using these operational layers, Mesos, Kubernetes, Swarm, Docker Data Center. The key point is, as you move from here to here, your ops change. Right, And so what we showed earlier today maps into this. Let me close the big data bit. So that's something called Kubernetes. Kubernetes is the Google-led, Google, Red Hat, Microsoft, many other organizations. It's essentially a Docker coordination system. Now imagine your challenge is you could be running 1,500 processes on 12 machines. Right? So you need to keep track where all of those processes are, what are they doing, who owns them, which disks, are, if, you, if you're mounting storage to them, um, 
uh, what IP addresses they have, what's gonna, what, what the policy around them is. For example, if one dies, do I restart it? Do I grow more of them? Do I want to shrink less of them? All of that sort of operational stuff, that's handled by something like Kubernetes. Docker has a similar functionality in their commercial product, Docker Data Center. And Mesos is, can be used with Docker processes as well, but as a, more as a sort of, it's more commonly used as a sort of scheduling uh, uh, system. So I've got a bunch of stuff that needs to get done. Um, I throw that into Mesos and it schedules it out and then, and then I, I, I can aggregate the results effectively. So this is how we like to look at something like Kubernetes, just like this is how we like to look at something like OpenStack, right? This is a model, an application level model of, of, these, of these systems. So let me jump out of that and go in and have a look. This is that Kubernetes, and it's actually running on the same cluster of, cluster of hardware that, uh, that I showed earlier. So these are the QCT machines, and um, um, a bunch more have turned on now because I scaled out that cloud. I added some to the, to the OpenStack during the keynote, and then we also deployed Kubernetes afterwards. Um, that's what the model looks like in the GUI. This is what it looks like under the hood. Um, actually, the key pieces here are not like e e Elasticsearch, Kibana, Filebeat, and so on. Those are just monitoring systems that we like to wrap around because that, that is just a modern monitoring system. We keep track of what's going on at the, under the hood in all of those machines. But the key pieces here are Kubernetes Master Worker, Load Balancer, um, etcd, and Flannel, effectively. And what those are doing is essentially providing networking. Flannel there is essentially keeping track of IP addresses, so it lets, lets me do... Uh, an overlay network. You could use another SDN, PlumGrid would go in here um, very nicely. Anything that essentially get, lets you dynamically allocate IP addresses and tunnel traffic to them because each of those Docker processes is going to need its own IP addresses. And um, uh, uh, these guys are essentially doing the work of Kubernetes master and, and, and workers. They're essentially running all of those processes. And the load balancer, a very sort of common theme in this class of Docker single process containers is the idea that since the, the processes are stateless often, I can essentially grow more of them or less of them, and I typically want to load balance across them. So it's very common to have a load balancer as part of the cluster, part of the topology. So that's fairly common there. Uh, so what's going on here, these, these are the Juju charms effectively, and they're constantly exchanging messages. And I can operate this um, um, the same way I can operate anything with Juju. So if I say Juju Actions, um, Kubernetes, Worker, you'll see there's a set of actions that are encoded um, in the charms. So those are essentially best practice operations from around the world. Think of this as like reusable open source Chef or Puppet. It could be Chef, could be Puppet. I don't know what, what, it's, in, what it's written in in this case. But it lets me do things like... Um, um, uh, pause um, uh, a unit, and if I now say juju status and go and have a look at that one, um, you'll see it's paused. So that's the sort of operating experience, right? You're essentially saying, I've got a bunch of machines, those are running Kubernetes, I'm running processes on top of those processes. Uh, on top of those machines, and I might want to take one of the machines out of rotation. That means I'm going to shoot all the processes on there. Typically, they're stateless. That's fine. The system will automatically restart or respawn more of those Docker processes on the other machines. I can replace disks, do whatever I want to do, and then bring that, bring that machine back into the cluster. This, if I switch, so you see um, there's a set of, I don't know if you can see, there's a set of models in that Juju controller, and one of them is Nova XD. So if I switch to that, and show the status, this is the equivalent model, but for OpenStack. And actually, you can see that we like to put a lot of the, we like to put a lot of services inside LexD containers. So I've got bare metal machines there, right? LexD gives me a machine-like construct. Any app I can put on bare metal, I can also put in a VM. I can also put in LexD and operate it the same way. So I can take these charms, things like neutron gateways and MySQLs and stuff like that, 
and I can put them into LexD containers. So actually, in this model, I'm using bare metal and LexD containers to run an OpenStack, which itself will then launch um, uh, LexD containers. And if you see, um, if you look at the at the actions, the operations actions essentially associated with the OpenStack charms, they look very similar to the sorts of actions, you'd, operational actions you'd see on something like Kubernetes. I've got a hypervisor essentially. Kubernetes has got running processes, not machines, but it's the same sort of idea. And if I might want to take that hypervisor out of rotation, so you see how the operations sort of come into line, essentially have a common set of patterns. And, and as I said, that OpenStack happens to be happens to be launching instances. So I think I'm out of time. I think I'm out of time. But if I, if I launch hit, op, uh, instances here in this OpenStack, then it's actually using LexD as a hypervisor, not KVM. So I will get machine containers. That's a natural thing for OpenStack to manage, right? Kubernetes or uh, Docker Data Center would manage processes, Docker processes. OpenStack is better at managing machine-like containers, right? It, it, more of the semantics of OpenStack makes sense with LexD because it's like KVM effectively. All right, I think we have to wrap there. Any, any questions? I didn't really get into storage. I know that was a big thing, but Cinder will map storage in there. It just has to essentially present it as file systems. Yeah? Any other questions? That all makes sense. Does it look easy? It should look easy. Very good. Thank you very much.